Good morning, guys. Good morning. Before we start the children's sermon, I just wanted to take a second and say thank you, because today is my last Sunday as the interim children's minister, and I leave to go back to Radford University tomorrow to start my senior year and student teaching. I also wanted to say thank you to all the parents for allowing me to spend time with your kids this summer and for bringing them to all of my activities and my children's sermons and allowing me to act like a kid with them most of the time. And thank you to the kids for all your smiling faces every Sunday and for making my summer so much fun and for all of the hugs. My Sundays back at school will not be the same without all your hugs. So now let's get started with the children's sermon. How many of you like to read? A couple of you? No, you don't. <laughs> what kind of books do you like to read? Maybe Junie B. Jones, you, yeah, Magic Treehouse, Wayside School, any of those? What, what's your favorite to- book to read, Savannah? <laughs> All of them. Good answer. <laughs> what do you like, Patrick? You read too much? That's not, that's not a thing. <laughs> Mason, what do you like to read? Magic Treehouse. All right. Well, I brought one of my favorite books from when I was little to share with you today. It's called A Fairy Called Hillary. And really, this was only my favorite book when I was little because a fairy called Hillary goes to live with a girl named Caroline, so I thought the book was about me. So I'm going to read some of it to you, okay? But I don't think we can read the whole book during the children's sermon, do, can we? It's a chapter book, I know, so we can't read the whole thing. It's very long. You're right. (laughs) I can hardly believe it myself now that a fairy came to live with us when I was younger. We weren't allowed to talk about it at the time except to one another. Hillary asked us not to. We were on our way to the Natural History Museum when Hillary arrived that Sunday. I had just asked Daddy if he believed in fairies. He said no, which didn't surprise me. Mother thought for a moment before answering. So it sounds pretty good so far, right? Yeah? Anybody have a guess of what's going to happen next? Mason? She might say yes. Anybody else have a guess, Savannah? Maybe the fairy will come? Well, let's just... What do you think, Patrick? Patrick? So Patrick thinks a tooth fairy is going to come and take the tooth and turn it into magic dust and then leave a quarter or some money under their pillow. (laughs) That was a good guess. So let's skip to the middle and maybe we'll find out. Wow, said Helen to no one in in particular. He's good, isn't he? I want to see the doll called Gina. I want to hold the puppies, said Adrian. I haven't had a turn yet. She looked around the room. Hey, where are the other two puppies? Suddenly, there was confusion. All of us got up and ran about Susie's house looking for the puppies. So now what do you think is going to happen? You don't know, Mason? Maybe they'll find puppies. What do you think? You don't know? (laughs) Savannah, what do you think? Everything will disappear. Well, do we know what the mom's answer was about fairies from the first part that I read to you? No? Well, maybe if we just skip right to the last page, we'll figure out how everything happens, okay? There's always room for a cat, Hillary assured him. I sat back down at the table and picked up my pencil. Ready if you are, Hillary, I said. Let's get this story underway. So that was a great book, right? No, that's the end. I know. You guys didn't like it? Because you didn't get to hear all of it. You're right. You only got to hear like four words. Well, this is a lot like the Bible, but the Bible has 66 books instead of just one. I know. That's a lot of stories for us to read and learn about, isn't it? Oh, my word. 
Well, a lot of people read the Bible kind of like I just read this book to you, and they only read parts of it. But we just figured out that if you don't read the whole story, then you're not going to know what it's about, right? <laughs> well, if you read the whole Bible, you need to treat every single book, all 66, like they're their own chapter book. And so you need to read them by themselves. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to read all of the Bible at once. You can read little parts of it at a time, maybe with your mommy or daddy. <laughs> so it, we, I want you guys to try and start to read the Bible and read the whole thing, but it might take a while. But guess what? I happen to know that the Bible, only four years, that's probably a good guess. <laughs> well, I happen to know that the Bible has a really great ending for all of us. So will you guys pray with me? <laughs> Dear God, Thank you for giving us all of your stories. Please help us to read them and learn more about you and your good works. We love you, God. Amen. So you all stay right there. We're going to say something for just a moment. <laughs> Caroline, stand up. <laughs> On behalf of the church, the children's leadership team, the parents, this whole church. We knew Caroline would be special for this summer. We just didn't know how special she would be. She has been awesome. That's the word we could keep hearing. I say to do these children's sermons, you just saw it. I can't do that kind of thing. You, know, you all don't talk back during sermons, uh, but they, you never know what's going to come in these children's sermons. <laughs> I want to say this word as well. It's something I've really thought about. Caroline is a product of this church. She grew up in this church. I told her several times, you have missed her calling. But she really has it. She's going into early education. She obviously has a gift with children. Beautiful spirit. And we need school teachers like you. Thank you. Very much, Natalia. So I just want to say on behalf of all of us, you have so much met what we are hoped for this summer and carried the children's ministry. Really, we've had more activities even than usual. And the children's sermons and all have just been outstanding. You've been used well by God, and we thank you and give praise to God for your gifts. And want to give you a little you. appreciation to thank you for such gifts you have brought us. So thank you. Okay, all right. So today we continue a series throughout the month of August on the good book. Today, I want to talk about how to read this book that we have read maybe so much or so little. There is a way to do that that can make it come alive more than ever. Each week, there are so many passages that are such obvious ones in talking about Scripture. And so, no less today, I invite you to hear from 1 Peter. Peter, towards the end of his journey, with all the ups and downs of his life, all the experiences of the living word that is Christ. He writes these words in the first chapter of 1 Peter, beginning with verse 23. He says, you have been born anew, not a perishable seed, but of un imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails but the word of the Lord abides forever. And then in that longest of all chapters in Psalm 119, we find those words, I have hid thy word in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Then going over to the 105th verse, the words we have heard throughout this series, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible has often been called the least read bestseller in the world. Year after year, no book on New York Times bestseller list comes close to the number of sales of that which is true of the Bible in all its many translations. And yet for all that, all the evidence seems to suggest that increasingly in our country, we are becoming biblically illiterate. George Gallup pulls no punches. He says, Americans read the, revere the Bible, but by and large, they just don't read it. Listen to these statistics and be alarmed. 
Fewer than half of all adults in America can name all four gospels. Many Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the disciples. According to the Barna survey, 60% of Americans cannot name five of the 10 commandments. 82% of Americans think that the quote, God helps those who help themselves is straight out of the Bible. Christians did better with that by 1%. Another survey found that 12% of adults believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Another survey of graduating high school students thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. Now, if that's not funny to you, you need to go and read your Bible a little bit more. And then just as many believe that the Sermon on the Mount was a sermon preached by Billy Graham. We are in big trouble here in this country. And what this means for the Christian church today and in its future cannot be ignored. For the clear truth of Christian history is that the church has never been more alive and more powerful when, than when its members read and studied the Bible most diligently. One of the most distinguished theologians of our time wrote these words. He said, every great reformation in the Christian church has begun with a revival of Bible study. The Bible inspired the mystics of the Middle Ages to pursue the interior life. It gave Luther the impetus, which led to the great ecclesiastical house cleaning that we know as the Reformation. It occasioned the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which ushered in the foreign missionary movement. It is the course book by which our modern reformers go for their social gospel. No other single influence has contributed so much to the Christian life as the daily reading of the Bible. So what must be happening today is that people buying all those Bibles, either they're not reading them or they don't understand what they are reading. And I would suggest that it's very possible, in fact, very possible that the either and the or are related. The people are not reading the Bible but so much because they don't understand what it is they are reading. Let's face it, there's a lot of places in the Bible that are not exactly easy reading. So given that, could we not agree that maybe some guidance and how it is that we can make this word come more true and alive for us might in fact be welcome words indeed. In my experience in worship, both for years sitting in the pew and by all these years behind the pulpit, I can never remember but one message that even spoke to this kind of thing. And yet I'm convinced that maybe this message is the most important of all the four messages in this series. For until we can understand the Bible, we can never really know the power of the Bible. And so this morning, I wanted my goal is to very simply suggest four ways, helpful aids to how you can read the Bible that have become more God's word for you. Let me say right off, this is not an inspirational sermon today. This is not gonna keep you on the edge of your seat. This is more an educational kind of message, if you will. So four ways to read the Bible that I think will greatly help if you're not already doing this. First of all, read each book as a whole book by itself. This is kind of what Caroline was talking about in her children's sermon. Don't do that point your finger kind of approach. I've done it at times, it's very lazy, it's very easy. Just want some word and so open up the page and just you know, go to a straight verse. And so it says, as his hand which he stretched out against him dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. Well, that ain't gonna do much for me. Yeah, so I had a lady in my first church, she did that kind of thing. And she came and told me, she pointed her finger to where it came in the Bible. It said that that verse that Judas went and hung himself. So since that didn't do much for her, she tried it a second time and the verse was, go thou and do likewise. You see, you don't want to do that. That's not the way to read the Bible. The Bible is more than snips and pieces. 
The Bible, each book in it, almost without exception, is whole cloth. And so it's need to understand that with each book, each author was writing to a certain group of people, perhaps, or certainly out of a certain context or a certain issue going on. And to understand that is critical to understanding the Bible. Imagine something like Caroline did. I, I heard a religion professor who came to his class. He brought with him all these lengthy letters. He just took one page out of each letter and then read them in sequence. Made absolutely no sense at all. And for us to just take a chapter or take a verse here and there and take them out of the context and out of the whole piece just misses the point altogether. And so that's the first word. Read each book like a whole novel, maybe by James Patterson or listening to a whole symphony by Beethoven. Let the full message of it be worked out and understood in so doing. But the second thing I would say Read to see what the author was trying to communicate in that day so that you can understand what it means for you in this day. Ask yourself, to who was he writing? What was the context? What was the issue going on? You see, sometimes we read the Bible and then we just very quickly say, to me it means, to me it means such and such. This is to me, which is never a valid way to operate until you first understand what the writer means, and then you bring it to what it can mean for your own life. I know there are some who are the more pious ones who think you can read the Bible and every word was written specifically for you when that person wrote it, which is hard for me to get my mind around when I come to any number of examples. You come to Paul writing to young Timothy. He, does, he says to Timothy, my child in the faith, he doesn't say to Bill over the hill preacher in Wake Forest. He says to Timothy. And so there's something going on that relates to specific word. And then we take that and then with the inspiration of God, we find what does that mean that he wrote to Timothy that can be a truth for us as well. Our Episcopal friends once say, often say, Jesus died to take away our sins, not our minds. And so with a clear, open mind, we look at what's being written, why it was written, to whom it was written, and then we can assess what that message is for our time. I think one of the more obvious examples, there are countless ones, Paul's admonition to the church at Corinth. He said very clearly, you can look at it, he said, let your women keep silence in the church. So if I make that an eternal word, I get up here and say, you ladies, you got to just zip it. You, know, you can't talk in the church. You can't pray in the church. You can't teach in the church. You can't sing in the church. You can't speak up at church conference. I think we all get the idea that this was not an eternal word. Paul was speaking to a very specific issue in Corinth at that time. The church was just fracturing under quibbling and gossiping and chatter that was just undermining the gospel witness. And so Paul writing to this church, realizing it's an early church and people everywhere are looking for them to see what they stand for and how they act. is saying, listen, right now to restore some order, I need for you ladies to stop all this chatter and all this talk that's going on for the sake of your witness and the sake of this church. But that was for the church at Corinth. That was for that time. It wasn't a, for all time in every church. And so third of all, I recommend this from my own experience. I've been to seminary for three years, three and a half years. I've done doctoral work. Whenever you read the Bible, get as much assistance for, as you possibly can. And what I'm talking about is especially the use of commentaries. You know, to read the Bible just on your own. For me still, and I don't claim to be a scholar, there's just, what that does, it limits me to just my knowledge, my experience, my biases that I bring to it. But then I open up these commentaries and there are scores of them. And I wanna say a cautionary word, there are as many bad ones out there as there are good ones. 
but to open up to the world of knowledge, to the world of those who are greater scholars than myself, is just to open up the world of the Bible in ways that can never happen if I just leave it to myself. So if you wanna be a clear student of the Bible, get some commentaries. If you don't know which ones, email me and I'll recommend you one. But here's one I would just maybe simply invite you to think about to start with. You know, we use the New International Version around here. It's very reputable as the Pew Bible. I would encourage you just to go out and get a New International Version study Bible. It's not a whole list of commentaries or fill up a shelf or a whole di disc on your computer, but it's something as you read the Bible, right there on the very pages are very brief, but very excellent commentaries that help you immediately. You can just look right on the same page to see, okay, here's something I would not have known. It's just in my own reading. Yeah, I've been to the Holy Land four different times. Every time there's been some guide that has been with our group, and inevitably, every time I come back, I have some new understanding. Some of the Bible has come open for me more than ever because I had a guide that taught me things that I never knew or was never taught in seminary. The same thing with commentaries. To just broaden your understanding, there are so many helps out there that can just make move you from being just a reader to being a really truly alive person because of the power of the gospel. And so finally, and maybe most importantly, approach every reading of your Bible with an open mind, but also with an open spirit. I read an article this week, it just, just was so obvious. It says, so often when we read the Bible, we come out of it the same way we went into it. In other words, we read it through the prism of my way of looking at things. This is what I want it to say. Yet he said, take a test. Ask yourself, how often have you really changed your position on some contemporary issue because of your reading of the Bible? So often we still stick with our provincial views, our own way of looking at things. Read the Bible with an open mind and also an open spirit so that that Spirit of God can speak to you. And so it can just fan a spark of inspiration to become just what is a living flame in your life. You know, it's impossible, it's as impossible for me to describe the vast experiences that are found in the pages of the Bible as it would be for me to try to talk about what it'd be like to travel to the safaris of dark Africa or the far off Fiji Islands. Karl Barth, he talks about this strange new world found in the Bible. For all its general truth in the Bible, there is truth that's true for every person in this room. There is also some very personal truth, truth that is uniquely true for your story and your particular place in life. Hopefully you've had the same experience that I've had. You read some word and suddenly it opens up. This is a word for me in my time right now in my life. Or maybe you are just in the swirling seas of some storm in your life. And you come to some psalm and suddenly there is a new light that come, turns on and you feel some reassurance. Or maybe there comes a point where you are available to a new and fresh revelation because you just were in that spirit in that moment that God was able to speak to you. This is why you've all had this experience, I trust. We can read the Bible again and again and again and still find something new and fresh. And that's because, not because the Bible is different, but because you are different and it has an eternal truth to it. And so it's like a great chandelier with all the crystals, just facet, many facets because the light hits you at different times in different ways. So how critical it is that you just open up, maybe pray before you read, God, what do you want to say to me in this? What new fresh word is there that's just uniquely, and there's a reason you wanted me to read this and to know this, Otherwise, we become just scholars of the word without really hearing 
the fresh voice of God that comes in the Bible message. How often has it happened? How often has it been my experience and I hope yours? Some person reads the scripture and then become aware of a whole new purpose for their life. Some person reads it and now they find the strength to make it through the valleys that they are struggling through. Some person reads it and they say, gosh, I've read this before, but it never spoke to me. And now it seems like it's just meant for me. How did I miss that before? Because you're a different person. Keep on reading, keep on reading, keep on reading. The psalmist knew it. That's why we keep going back to that verse. This Bible, it's not a textbook. It's not an ancient book for ancient times. It's a living word for the living of your life right now. This Bible is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I love what Peter said. I, and you think about Peter's life, all the ups and downs, all the betrayals, all the getting it meant wrong every turn. And then he goes, but the flower fades, the grass withers. Oh, but this word of the Lord, it endures forever. In this word, have you been there? We hear a voice calling our name and realize that all of life has come to our address. Friends, you will never believe more than you know. You will let, never live any higher than what your beliefs are. So may it be that we never get to that point of hoping that Sodom and Gomorrah live happily ever after. And so your homework this week, every week you have homework to read, I invite you. What you know, I wanted to go from the Old Testament, I'm gonna do something a little different. I went to the scholar, but I'm, I'm doing my own thing. Deuteronomy 8, the eighth chapter of Deuteronomy. And I want you to particular focus on the words remember, 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 remember. What God wants you to remember. Is there some word from Moses that is a word for you? It's just a powerful, the first seven verses in my real Bible, they're all underlined for all the whole seven verses and several others later on. Remember, Moses says from God, that it's not by your strength or not by your might that you got your wealth. Remember the commandments. Remember the Lord who took, brought you through the wilderness. Remember your story and what God has done for you. Our hymn of invitation this morning, ancient words, hymn number 31. Maybe there are some this morning who want to give your life to Christ in a public kind of way. Maybe unite with this church or another church family or some renewed commitment. I'll be at the front to receive you. Let us stand and sing to the glory of God, hymn number 31. Let me say a word of welcome to those who are guests with us. We celebrate that you've added to our company. We have a guest reception room over to the side. Janice in Chicago from our outreach team would love for you to stop by. We can share any information with you. But let me say even more, a better invitation yet. This is about three or four times a year we have a guest luncheon. And today is our guest luncheon day. We have the largest crowd we've ever had of number of guests. We're delighted that you're coming. If you are a guest, if you even remotely apply to that and you haven't made a reservation, we have more than enough for you. So we would love for you to come over to the fellowship hall and join everybody else for a very brief lunch for, as a treat on behalf of us. So please come if you're a guest, we'd love for you to be a part of that. So let us bow for the benediction and the words that in the printed in the bulletin that we are singing during this series. Christ before you, Christ behind you, Christ within you, grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, love, all love, Jesus Christ our Lord, thanks be to God.